Vaccine eligibility is expanding as mask mandates take a back seat. This is a special news roundup from KMUW and 1A. Hi, I'm Jen White. Today on the show, a special collaboration only for KMUW listeners, a Wichita News Roundup. This week, officials said masks would be optional in school and students are headed back soon. President Biden wants everyone eligible for the vaccine by May. Can Kansas make that deadline? Plus, last night ended the Shockers NCAA hopes, but it was still a historic season. We'll get to all of it and answer your questions on today's Wichita News Roundup. And we want to hear from you. Email us at info at KMUW.org or tweet us at KMUW. Hi, I'm Jen White, host of 1A. You know on 1A we love our Friday News Roundup. Well, today that's exactly what we're doing, only all about Kansas. Part of our 1A Across America project means staying in tune with the big stories in your community. So this week we teamed up with KMUW to bring you the Wichita News Roundup. We'll talk about the latest on the COVID vaccines and mask mandates, school reopening and development projects the pandemic put on hold. Here to tell us more is Nadja Fo. She covers local government for KMUW. Nadja, welcome. Hi, Jen. Thanks for having me. Also with us is Tom Shine, KMUW's Director of News and Public Affairs. Tom, welcome. Hello, Jen. And Teresa Lovelady joins us. She's the CEO of Health Corps Clinic. That's a community health center in Wichita. Teresa, hi. Hello. We also want to hear from you. What questions do you have about the vaccine rollout and COVID restrictions in Kansas? You can comment on KMUW's Facebook page, tweet us at KMUW, or send us an email at info at KMUW.org. So, Teresa, let's start with the vaccines. Around 20 percent of people in Kansas have received at least one shot so far. That's according to the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Who's eligible for the vaccine right now? Well, currently it's open to individuals in phase one and phase two. I know by Monday next week, we're gonna open it up to phases three and four in Kansas. Uh, That means almost everyone um, will be able to be vaccinated. And when I include everyone, that's all healthcare workers, uh, anyone, uh, any essential worker. Um, We're also looking at um, in phase three and four, this will include people age 16 to 64 with severe medical risk. Uh, These include people with chronic disorders such as cancer, uh, Down syndrome, heart conditions, diabetes, or sickle cell anemia, I mean sickle cell disease, I'm sorry, um, including uh, just a host of individuals. And in phase four, it also includes individuals at uh, with other medical risk, um, including obesity and severe obesity. So um, we're, um, by next week, we're really going to open up Um, the opportunities for individuals to access the vaccine. Now, I want to make sure we're really clear on the age guidelines here. We're talking about people 16 and up, correct? Yes, 16 and up. So uh, phase one included uh, individuals uh, 65 and older. Um, And so uh, anyone 65 and older was already eligible. So individuals in phase three and four will include those 16 to 64. So um, at this point, Um, or starting on Monday uh, within the state of Kansas and also depending on your local county um, health guidance and health ordinance based on your county health department um, and their vaccine availability. That's the other big part, right? Mm -hmm. Access to the vaccine, how much vaccine is available in your community. Uh, Those phases will be open to individuals in those communities. Well, late last week, President Joe Biden announced that the next phase of his nationwide vaccination strategy came with a new deadline for states to meet. I'm announcing that I will direct all states, tribes, and territories to make all adults, people 18 and over, eligible to be vaccinated no later than May 1. Nadja, what have Kansas leaders said about meeting this new deadline? Well, like Teresa mentioned, Governor Kelly said earlier this week that Kansas is moving into phases three and four starting Monday. 
And with the, an increased supply of vaccines and opening up the eligibility so much, Kansas should be on track to get to phase five, which is the general population, 16 and up, should be able to get to phase five by May. So that's in line with what Biden's directing. And what do we know about that vaccine availability piece of this? It's gotten a lot better. Um, it was kind of a bumpy rollout to start. There were some counties with too much vaccine, others with not enough, um, including Sedgwick County, which is one of the larger ones in Kansas. So now it seems to be evening out a bit to where the county health department here says there is enough. They're ready to take on this new, these two new expanded phases um, of people coming in for the vaccine. So accessibility has really opened up and, and so far, I think people are ready to handle these next two phases. Tom, when we look at where vaccines have been available so far, what have been the prime distribution points? Uh, for for the most part, the counties have been handling that. County health departments and Sedgwick County, they've got two large clinics set up, um, as well as a, a mobile clinic. They've in, uh, included then community health centers like, like Teresa runs as well, some of those places as well. Um, but for the most part, it's been a county operation, and now it's starting, as they get more vaccine in, they're starting to spread that out a little bit more and bringing in more community partners. We're talking to KMUW's Tom Shine and Ned Jaffo. Also with us is Teresa Lovelady, the CEO of Health Core Clinic. That's a community health center in Wichita. We also want to hear from you. What questions do you have about the vaccine rollout and COVID restrictions in Kansas? You can comment on KMUW's Facebook page, tweet us at KMUW, or send us an email at info at KMUW.org. Teresa, when you look at the vaccine rollout, who do you think has been left behind so far? Well, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic's impact in the, in the United States has exposed longstanding inequalities by race, ethnicity, and income. And the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately impacted the African-American community and, and communities of color, including our Hispanic and our Asian communities. We know that um, Black people or African-American is account for 25% of those who have tested positive and 39% of those with COVID-related deaths, um, but while making up only about 15% of the population, I know that um, um, we also know that African-Americans are dying of coronavirus 2.5 or three times higher than other groups. Um, there are just so many different social determinants that determinants of health and long-standing inequalities around housing, transportation, occupation, access to health. We we know that African American and Latino people, women and people of lower incomes have faced significantly greater hardships and I mean just going on and on and on. We know that um, the vaccine just hasn't really gotten into the arms of those individuals mm -hmm. at an even rate. Um, and I and I know that um, we've been working really hard and we've had limited access to vaccines and 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 now we have to employ uh, strategies to, to really target these communities, these vulnerable populations that have not had um, that have not been vaccinated um, um, proportionately. Mm -hmm. um, I know in Sedgwick County, uh, Health Corps Clinic has been working with Grace Med and Hunter Health Clinic to make sure that we're specifically targeting vulnerable communities and populations based on the data we have from the patients we serve. You know, we know where the virus has, has really hit our community the hardest. And so we know where the positive cases are. Um, and so we're really trying to really target those populations. We're very thankful that HRSA, our, um, that the federal government has implemented a federal vaccine program that allows direct ship shipment of vaccines to community health centers um, across the United States. And, and we've been partnering to hold specific clinics in targeted neighborhoods to make certain that there is access to the vaccine. And we also know that there's vaccine hesitancy, hesitancy and reluctance um, to getting the vaccine because of all of the, all of the uh, lack of information, miscommunication around the vaccines. Um, so we are really working hard to make certain that we're dispelling some of those myths and letting individuals know that the vaccines are free. That's a huge thing that no insurance is needed um, and that it's available to anyone. And, and then also providing that education piece mm -hmm. and dispelling some of the myths around uh, COVID-19. 
Tom, we, we know there's been sort of a piecemeal response to the pandemic um, at a national level. State by state, there are different rules, different guidelines on different approaches to the vaccine rollout. But when we look at Kansas, how are individual counties approaching this? Well, the state is engineering the, the operation because they're getting most of the vaccine in. Uh, there's a few federal clinics that are getting it in. But for the most part, vaccine comes to the state and the state disperses it to the counties. Um, and like Nadia mentioned earlier, it, it, it was sort of a kind of a herky-jerky rollout. It seems to be getting a little bit smoother. Part of the problem is that Kansas has about four or five, maybe six large populous counties and then 100 really small counties. And the state has not allowed counties to move into the next phase until all the counties have completed the phase. So so a county with you know 2,000 people might be done, and they're waiting on Sedgwick County or Johnson County to finish up because we have so many more people here. So I think the state has done a little bit better job here lately of getting more vaccines to the populous counties and then trying to move them through the process faster. I think Sedgwick County was hoping to do 16 to 17,000 vaccinations this week. So that's up significantly in the last couple of weeks. Mm. Teresa, we've just got about a minute here. What is the role of community health centers in ensuring access to the vaccine? Well, community health centers from the very beginning with testing um, and also treatment, uh, we had a lot of individuals that that needed access to care that did not have access, that were uninsured, that lost their jobs, that needed um, just just needed the support, additional support. Um, community health centers have always served as a safety net within their community, and our response to COVID-19 has been such that when other dental facilities or other medical facilities shut down to COVID-19, many of us kept our doors and our hearts open to make certain that no one was turned away, even when it came to a COVID-19 diagnosis. Um, and so we, we've been here before the pandemic, during, and definitely um, post-pandemic, we'll be here to serve our communities. We're talking to Teresa Lovelady, CEO of Health Corps Clinic. That's a community health center in Wichita. Also with us, KMUW's Nettie Foe and Tom Shine. I'm Jen White. This is the Wichita News Roundup, a special collaboration between 1A and KMUW as part of our Across America partnership. We'll be back in a moment. I'm Jen White, and this is the Wichita News Roundup, a special collaboration between 1A and KMUW as part of our Across America partnership. We're talking about the big stories of the week from COVID restrictions easing to schools reopening and everything in between. With us, Nadia Foe, a reporter for KMUW, Tom Shine, the Director of News and Public Affairs at KMUW, and Teresa Lovelady. She's the CEO of Health Core Clinic. That's a community health center in Wichita. We're also hearing from you. Christina tweeted, I've been really happy with how well Sedgwick County is rolling out the vaccine. My adult family members have been able to get vaccinated much sooner than I originally thought we would. Also, the old life library clinic they set up is so well run, making it really quick and easy. Christina, thanks for that. And we also got this tweet from Rebecca who says, is there any hope of Medicaid expansion for camp for Kansas? Beyond the pandemic, our health care system is racist and broken. Tom? I think that seems unlikely on Medicaid. I know that the recent uh, stimulus bill from uh, the Joe Biden side included money to try to get uh, I think there's 12 states that don't have Medicaid expansion, and Kansas is one of them. To try to get them to uh, to bite at that uh, at that apple, so to speak, I don't I don't see that's going to happen. It's uh, been introduced in the legislature. Uh, is, is tied to a a medical marijuana bill, but I don't I don't think that's going to happen this session. Well, as vaccinations have made their way into communities, Wichita has started to reopen in the past couple of weeks. On Monday, Sedgwick County Health Officer Dr. Gerald Menz signed a new health order easing capacity restrictions but keeping the mask mandate. And here's his reasoning. The virus is still in the community. People are still getting infected. People are still being admitted to hospital. There is still virus that can be spread to other people. The majority of our population is not immune. The majority of our population is still susceptible to this virus. The majority of our population is potentially made very sick by this virus. Fortunately, we got most of the elderly people vaccinated, so the, those who get the most sick 
for the most part are vaccinated, but we've got a lot of other people, and we've had a number of young people who have had bad outcomes from this virus. So, I, I, and again, the mask is well proven. The literature is there that it does prevent spread and it does reduce the number of people getting infected. So, from my perspective, it's a well, it's an inconvenient thing to do. We've all kind of gotten used to it. Can we can we continue just to do it for a, maybe another month or two? and help us get to the finish line. Nadia, what should people know about this health order? Well, it essentially does away with all the restrictions that the county's been under since, you know, last March. Um, There's no more curfew on bars and restaurants. There's no more gathering limits. But um, like Minz was saying, it, it really only keeps in place the mask requirement and the social distancing, which, you know, the CDC, I think, said now it can be about three feet. Um, and the county's been easing restrictions over the past couple months of cases have fallen. Um, like I said, they got away with, they did away with the bar curfew that's been in place since about July. And I've just slowly, slowly you know, lessened all the restrictions on gatherings and business capacity. So it's, it's just moving into, in that direction. Tom, what's been the community response to this new order? Hasn't really been one yet. It doesn't go into effect until 12.01 Sunday morning. So it's still a little bit early. Um, you know, I think restaurants, even though they don't have capacity limits anymore, they still require to do social distancing. So they've got to keep tables six feet apart. Uh, so I don't know that they're going to still be at full capacity. So uh, I'm not sure that that's going to help them as too much. Um, you know, Minz was good with the order. Um, he likes the mask and social distancing um, the restrictions because in his mind, they cause less economic harm than other measures like curfews and, and, and outright closures. Um, I think the biggest question will be, when will customers feel comfortable returning to bars and restaurants? And what about health leaders? What are we hearing from them? Uh, like I said, Minz, uh, Minz is, the, is the county health officer, so he's sort of the lead guy. Um, he was comfortable with um, reducing um, some of the gathering limits and the capacity limits. Uh, he was fairly adamant, though, about keeping the mask mandate in place and the social distancing in place for the foreseeable future. Teresa, as someone working with a community health center in Wichita, what do you think about loosening these restrictions? Well, I I know last year, um, or since the start of the pandemic, Health Corps has tested uh, 4,400 individuals, um, and we tested positive about 246 individuals. And I can tell you many of the people we tested positive were uninsured and and uh, were low income and essential workers. And, and you know, the, it, it was really tough because they, um, you know, so when we open everything up, we, we are really taking our most vulnerable people in our community and putting them at risk. I'm very thankful that we've opened up phases three and four so we can get, you know, some more individuals vaccinated while we're trying to open up simultaneously. But it's our greatest fear that whenever we move too soon that we start seeing more people showing up um, for testing and more people testing positive. And it's, again, our most vulnerable um, members of our community. And many of them don't have health insurance. And we didn't expand um, Medicaid in Kansas. So they're uninsured and they're having to deal with this, um, um, the recovery from this without insurance coverage, mm-hmm. you know. And community health centers across the state, we served over 261,000 individuals across the state of Kansas, um, all of the community um health centers and and many of them were uninsured many of them were uninsured because we haven't had that so uh, how how would you communicate with the community in this moment about what the easing of restrictions means right now and how we should be thinking about this in this moment well we have to wear a mask and uh, like I said, it's it's it could be seen as inconvenient inconvenient but put the mask on you know respect those that don't have haven't been vaccinated yet and those that are showing up for work you know like the healthcare professionals that are still showing up on the front lines and and are you know the people who work in the bars and at the grocery stores and our teachers you know so let's still practice the social distancing and and uh, still and and get vaccinated so if you have the opportunity to get vaccinated with whichever vaccines available get vaccinated as well but we have to do it together and and we can't take our, our eye off the goal to get immunity in our community. 
you know, to get to that threshold where we can get post COVID-19 and get back to some form of normalcy. We can't rush it. That's Teresa Lovelady, the CEO of Health Corps Clinic, a community health center in Wichita. Teresa, thanks so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Still with us are KMUW's Nettie Foe and Tom Shine. And we also want to hear from you. What do you think of the loosening restrictions? You can comment on KMUW's Facebook page, tweet us at what at KMUW, or send us an email at info at KMUW.org. So, Nettie, there was big news this week when it comes to wearing masks in class. Schools in Sedgwick County now have an optional mask mandate. Let's listen. I want to trust these elected officials to make good policy for their own schools. They understand locally better than we do. And I think that the decision in Wichita may be different than the position in Renwick. And I think that's okay. That was Sedgwick County Commissioner Jim Howell. Nadia, what do we need to know about this change? So like Howell was saying, the justification is pretty much that there's 20 school districts in the county. They all have different circumstances and maybe a mask mandate or these health guidelines aren't what's best for each of them individually. Um, It was a 3-2 vote that split on party lines, so that was the reasoning for the changes. The commissioners who voted against it said that it could cause another spike in COVID-19 cases at a time when, you know, the numbers are falling and we're doing really well, so so why rush things? Um, A lot of school districts are on spring break right now, so they really haven't had a chance to say whether they are going to opt in or do away with their mask mandates. Um, Wichita Public Schools, the biggest school district in the state, already said that they are keeping the the mandate. Derby Public Schools said they are going to for the time being. So we kind of have to see as schools start to come back from spring break, what direction they're going to go. How are teachers reacting to this news? Uh, And that's difficult to gauge too, just because Schools aren't in session for the week. Most many districts aren't. um, So there's not been time to react. I know just informally teachers I've spoken to here in Wichita really want to see caution, want to see things going slowly. Students are coming back in um, and teachers say, you know, they want to be as safe as possible while they're still getting vaccinated. You know, don't don't lower the guardrails too soon. Tom, as we said, most school districts in Kansas have in-person learning. Wichita is one of only six that are not in person at this point, but that's about to change. What's the latest on in-person learning in Wichita? Um, Well, elementary schools in Wichita actually have been in person since the first of the year, although some students still are learning remotely. That's a choice that they and their parents can make every semester, whether to learn remotely or learn in person. So the K-5 through kids have been in for the most part since the first of the year. Middle and high school into a, went into kind of a hybrid model at the end of January, but everybody uh, will go with full in person on March 29th, which is when they return from spring break. So they'll join about 280 of the state's 286 districts that have students back full time. Any pushback to that from parents or teachers? I don't think so. Um, I think I, I think most parents are, are wanting their kids back in school, especially those who, you know, had several toddlers at home or younger kids at home. Um, I think this, uh, they, they feel comfortable sending their kids to school. Wichita, like most places, has, has not had um, outbreaks in schools or problems in schools. The biggest problem has been staff and having to uh, quarantine staff when they come into contact. But the students themselves have been have been relatively healthy. So I think they're okay with it. I think the teachers are probably okay with it, too. You know, Nettia, there's been some concern about how behind students might be after a year of virtual learning. Anything being proposed to deal with that? Yeah. And that, that definitely is a valid concern because with students not in the classroom for almost a full year, there hasn't been a, a chance to gauge how they're doing academically and how they're how they're measuring. Um, the governor is really supportive of expanding summer programs to you know get students caught up who need to get caught up to get them you know to make up for that lost learning. So she's been very vocal about Kansas needs to to pay for this. She said the state has a moral obligation to to fund these expanded programs in terms of you know teacher salaries, um, transportation, food, just giving districts extra money to pay for these. And in Wichita, they're already enrolling students in some expanded learning opportunities for um, elementary, middle, and high school students. And who's eligible for these programs? Is it just kids who have fallen behind, or if a parent is just concerned that maybe their kid has lost some ground, they can enroll them? 
That's a good question. As I understand it, the schools will be identifying students and encouraging them to enroll um, for mostly elementary students and, and middle school students. It's based on academic standards. And if their principals are seeing that they're kind of struggling academically and maybe need a little extra support in high school, there's some programs for credit um, recovery. You know, if they're failing in a core class and might not be able to graduate down the road, they want to get those students into these summer programs, too, to make sure that they get their the credits they need. And is there any cost associated with these extra programs? No. Um, majority are free. I think if you're getting a new credit, there might be a cost. But the district has been really clear that if there's a if it's a credit recovery program, it is free. Mm-hmm. Tom, when we think about the way we've moved through this pandemic so far, there have been you know peaks and valleys when we talk about infection rates. Do we have any understanding of how schools plan to respond if there's another spike of COVID cases? Well, the, the one good thing about the, the pandemic is it's taught everybody to be even more flexible than they were when it started. So I think the district's um, in Wichita and around here are probably a little bit better prepared to switch to full remote if need be, get students back in class if need be. I mean, I think most people think, and I'm you know, you know, knock on wood, that between the vaccine and the uh, and the lowering case rate, we may have we may have turned a corner. I know, I know in Michigan, for instance, the cases are spiking again. Mm-hmm. There's concern here about the variant. Uh, Dr. Minns talked about the variant being a, kind of a wild card in all this. But my guess is that you know Wichita schools will be out in the first uh, second week of May, maybe third week of May. So we're not too far out. Um, uh, but if something were to turn, I think they have the ability now. Uh, most students have technology that uh, they can take home um, in K through 12 and, and work from home. So I think they're much better at, at adapting to that uh, sort of last minute changes. We got this tweet from Christina who says, I'm really concerned about the possibility of mask mandates easing up. We've been virtually schooling our fourth and fifth grader for a year and we're thinking about moving them to in person. But without masks, I am worried since a vaccine may not be available to them until 2022. And that's something we need to make clear here, Tom, the fact that vaccines are not ready for younger kids quite yet. Yeah, that's true. I, they, certainly, the, the K through five kids, uh, going all the way probably through middle school, aren't aren't eligible for the vaccine yet. I mean, I don't think there's anything that, that would prevent a student from wearing a mask in school. Although, if nobody else is wearing one, you could wonder what what the whether that's good or not. Um, I know Wichita, like Nadia said, uh, is going to have is going to require masks for the rest of the year. Um, and I don't know about other districts in the area. There's so many of them, but um, it, I, I'm sure it's a concern uh, for parents sending their kids back. But again, like we said, for the most part, students have not been getting ill in, in, in large numbers at all at schools. And we should mention here that the CDC did announce new guidance today saying kids only need to be three feet apart in schools. Um, before we go to break, I want to get to this email from Andrew who says, it's important for me as a parent of children with diverse needs and backgrounds to feel welcome and safe in our community, have access to quality health care and unbiased education. The current state of Kansas government seems most interested in limiting transgender rights, decrying science-based health and safety initiatives to slow the spread of COVID-19. And Tom, Kansas is one of the states that's proposed legislation limiting options for some transgender student athletes. Explain what's in this bill. Um, it's a bill that would that would uh, bar transgender women, uh, but not transgender men, transgender women from par- participating in girls or or women's sports at the high school or college level. I think many states have are, have passed or are, are talking about similar legislation to become kind of a, a new culture war uh, front, as it were, much like the the bathroom bills what, from about 2016, 2017, sort of in that same line. Passed the state senate this week. It's gone to the Kansas House. It's worth noting the House had a similar bill but let it die in committee, so I'm not sure what the future of of this bill is. Um, Governor Kelly will likely veto it. She hasn't said that, but she will likely review it. She's called it a regressive bill and worries about the economic impact on the state if it's were to pass. So she'll pass. I'm sure she'll veto it if that comes to that. The question then will be whether the House and or Senate will override her veto. We're discussing the week's top stories with KMUW reporter Nadia Foe and Tom Shine, the station's director of news and public affairs. We also want to hear from you. You can email us 
at info at kmuw.org. Comment on KMUW's Facebook page. You can also tweet us at KMUW. What questions do you have about this week's news? I'm Jen White. We'll hear more from you and our guests in a moment. I'm Jen Wood. Let's get back to our Wichita News Roundup with KMUW reporter Nettie Foe and Tom Schein, the station's director of news and public affairs. We also want to hear from you. What politics stories caught your eye this week? You can comment on KMUW's Facebook page, tweet us at KMUW, or send us an email at info at KMUW.org. I want to get into some more political news in a moment, but first, Wicked Honeybee tweeted, as a member of the Wichita Kansas community, I am very concerned with many people who refuse to wear masks or wear them over their noses and mouths. What is Sedgwick County doing to help with this lax attitude, Tom? Not much. I mean, that's been always been the difficulty with the face mask ordinance is the enforcement part of it. Um, I don't believe anyone who's been ticketed or cited for wearing their face mask or not wearing their face mask will wear it improperly. I think it relies on people telling people to wear their face mask properly, um, which some people uh, ignore. So it's uh, it's always been a difficult thing. That's why a lot of people have pushed back against face mask mandates because it's that they're unenforceable. Well, Nettie, let's move on to some political news. There was an open seat on the Wichita City Council, and lawmakers found an interesting strategy to fill it. What's going on here? So in District 3 in South Wichita, there's been a vacancy since December after the representative resigned. Um, There was some involvement with an anti-mayoral ad from a couple of years ago that kind of snowballed this year. So he resigned in December and the process, I mean, it, it followed city code, so it wasn't, you know, anything outlandish or that exciting. It's local politics, Mm -hmm. but it just seemed to really drag on for some reason. And and the city council was voting among five candidates earlier this month to appoint a new member. They couldn't come to a consensus. They couldn't reach a majority. So they had to delay it for a couple of weeks, um, took up the vote again, and it seemed like we were going to have another stalemate. But finally, a a member switched her vote so that a candidate got the four votes needed. So um, the man named Jared Cirillo will be sworn in next week and um, yeah, the, the process will be over finally. What were the stakes at play in filling that seat? So the Wichita City Council is nonpartisan. Um, <clears throat> so it's not like this seat could have flipped Republican or Democrat or really swayed the balance of the full council. Um, but I will say that the candidate who was appointed, he had the backing of the, the more conservative leaning members. It was a four to two vote. Um, but I think really the biggest implication is for the residents in that district. They didn't have a representative for almost three months, didn't have a voice on the council. And I've seen some frustration being expressed online and and elsewhere that they're frustrated that they didn't get to vote for their new representative. This is just standard. It's happened in the past where the council appoints a new member when there's a vacancy. But residents are kind of frustrated that they didn't get to vote for this person. And the seat's up for election in November, so they'll have to wait until the next regular election to actually get to select their member. Well, Tom, Sedgwick County commissioners are partisan positions. What's the party makeup of the county commissioners and how has it changed recently? Well, the uh, the commission, which is five members, um, added a second woman and a second Democrat after the last election. Uh, Sarah Lopez joined Lacey Cruz on the panel. Um, Just a couple of election cycles ago, all five seats were all Republican and all white males. So why does this shift matter? Well, the county commission um, also acts as the board of health for Sedgwick County. So all the decisions, which was not a big deal until the pandemic, and then it became obviously a huge deal. All the decisions about the pandemic, health orders, closures, testing, vaccine, spending uh, federal relief dollars, all go through the commission as as their role as the uh, county uh, health board. So I, I think it's uh, that what has happened, I think, is the, the, the county's gotten a little less conservative. Um, one of the commissioners, Jim Howell, who we heard from a little bit earlier on the show, said he would like to end all health restrictions in the county, including the mask mandates, including social distancing. But he said he knew he didn't have three votes to do that. Well, a year ago, uh, he would have had three votes to do that. Well, Nadia, at the state level, the legislature is Republican controlled. Uh, but Governor Laura Kelly is a Democrat. How has that affected her ability to govern during this pandemic? It's been challenging. I think the the legislature has <clears throat> made some moves to 
kind of curb her powers um, early on in, in the pandemic, whenever she was trying to issue statewide mask mandates or or statewide phase in guidelines for reopening, the legislator made it so that legislature, excuse me, made it so that local governments had to opt into those. So she could make these mandates, but there were really no teeth because all the local governments could say, no, nah, we're, we're going to do something else. Um, so it definitely limited her in some ways. Um, like I mentioned, the, the mass mandate especially was, you know, it was more of a guideline after after the legislature curbed her powers. Um, so that made for some very patchwork regulations that differed county by county. Now, Tom, while the re- legislature is Republican controlled, are Republicans in the legislature in lockstep 100 percent? No, there's normally in Kansas politics, most people will tell you we have Democrats, moderate moderate Republicans and conservative Republicans. Um, the legislators got more conservative in, in the last in the last election, but they're not in lockstep. I mean, even on the transgender bill that uh, transgender athlete bill that passed, some Republicans voted against it. Um, so it's not. Uh, and then uh, the uh, uh, recent piece of legislation to r- require schools to be back in in-person classes failed in the House. Uh, Republicans voted it down and thought that it took away too much local control from school boards. And and those votes against the transgender athlete bill is what makes it possible for Governor Kelly to veto that if it lands on her desk and she uh, so chooses. Now, Governor Kelly came to office in 2018 and and she's up for re-election in 2020. Tom, there's already a lot of conversation around who will be running against her why are we already talking about the 2022 governor's race? I guess because we can, right? <laughs> um, it, seems, it seems like the election cycle never ends. The Republicans have made it made it a priority to, to to win back that seat. It's the only statewide office they don't hold, although I guess they don't hold the treasurer's office because Kelly put her lieutenant governor as treasurer because the treasurer went to Congress. Um, two prominent Republicans have already filed a run against her. So that's the main, main reason we're talking about it. Jeff Collier, who was... Um, a lieutenant governor for seven years under Sam Brownback, and then governor for a short time when Brownback left to join the Trump administration. He lost in the 2018 primary to Chris Kobach, and then who then lost to Kelly. So he's already filed. And then Derek Schmidt, the attorney general, um, he's a longtime state senator, is in his third term as attorney general, um, wins wins elections uh, by 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 mounds, very very popular. Many people thought he would seek higher office at some point, so he's jumped in the race too. But already Collier and Schmidt are trading barbs over who is the true conservative in the race. So, um, and, I, and my guess is there'll be more entries into that field. Maybe some more moderate Republicans might jump into that field before the primary in August 2022. Well, and when I think about the way you describe the legislature and, and the split between what's described as moderate Republicans as opposed to more conservative Republicans, does that divide make it easier for Democrats to hold on to the governorship? It, it, it makes it a little bit easier sometimes to govern. I don't know that it'll eat, it, uh, it makes it easier for them to hold the governor's office. It's we've had a we've had several uh, and it's funny it's several female women Democratic governors in the last few years or last few decades. Also also male Democratic governors too, but in, but we've never we haven't had a Democratic senator state U.S. senator since the Depression. So it's kind of a a funny mix how that works. But I don't know that I think she'll have a tough time just because it's a, it's a red state. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, her, and her handling of the pandemic will be on trial in the, in the campaign. We're talking to KMUW's Tom Shine. He's the station's director of news and public affairs. Also with us, Nettia Folk, a local government reporter. And Nettia, one big story out of southern Kansas are all these earthquakes, five separate quakes on Sunday alone. Do we know what's causing them? Investigators with the State Regulatory Commission, I believe, are looking at it to make sure, or not to make sure, but just to look into whether they're being caused by fracking. Oh, gosh, I shouldn't say that. And oil and and oil and gas activity, um, kind of looking into that. There was a, a series of earthquakes several years ago that were more centered in, in northern Oklahoma that I think were tied to that. But this... Experts say it's just a fault line in northeast Wichita, and there's just regular activity there that should settle down after a few months. So people shouldn't be too concerned at this point? Is that what they're saying? Yeah, I don't want to say people should be worried or shouldn't be worried because, you know, 
they freak me out. They're, they are kind of scary. Um, yeah. No one likes to feel them, and, and there have been so many in such a short period of time. Um, people are, are understandably worried about their houses, um, older homes having foundational damage, but experts say that if if these earthquakes continue, they probably won't get above a 4.5 um, magnitude, and that's probably not enough to cause really major structural damage. So people probably should not be worried. But I can imagine that it would be rather alarming uh, to fill an earthquake. Tom, before the pandemic hit, Wichita was wrapped up in concerns over the fate of Century 2. And this is the downtown library building and riverfront area and the new baseball stadium. Where does that stand now? Well, the baseball stadium is ready to go. It's set. It is. It is beautiful. We just haven't used it mm-hmm. because uh, minor league baseball was canceled last year. Um, uh, there's a game planned for April, Wichita State baseball game planned for April, and then the wind surge, which is our minor league team, is scheduled to to play it in May. So that's ready to go. Um, the billion dollar riverfront legacy master plan that was rolled out in January 2020. I mean, just ahead of the pandemic. Um, so that included you know, extensive redevelopment of the downtown river corridor, most notably a new performing arts center and a new convention center, which means we would have knocked down Century 2 and the old downtown library. Um, it's lost all momentum um, because of the pandemic, obviously. Um, the people who support the plan, and it was a large coalition of city, county, private groups, and they want to resume discussions this year, community discussions this year, and hope to get some of that momentum back that they lost during the pandemic. Well, and how much say will locals have and in, in what's going to happen? I, I think they'll have a say. Um, the price tag is going to be so high um, that some type of public contribution is going to be required, and that'll probably be a, most likely be a sales tax. And if we have an increase in sales tax, uh, the public has to vote on that. And then the people who want to preserve Century 2 and keep Century 2 and the library, they also want to vote on whether to keep the buildings and not let the city knock them down. Um, the city has promised a non-binding citizen vote, but they want a binding citizen vote, and they've gone the petition route to get that done, failed the first time on a technicality, but I'm sure they'll be back with another petition to do that. So my guess is the city will, the residents will have a say in that before it becomes part of uh, downtown. Well, we got another COVID question. Chris wrote on Facebook, I want to know why aviation was put before essential workers last week. Even Uber drivers were put behind aviation. Who do you think those workers get? How do you think those workers get to work and home? Rideshare drivers. Uh, Tom, any anything you can tell us about that? All I can say is that this is an aviation hub, obviously, and Wichita is the air capital of the world. So it's a large segment of of employees. It's an important segment of employees. And when you start parsing who's more important than other people in their jobs, but well, it's really, you know, once you get past, you know, doctors and nurses, I think it gets pretty, pretty tough. So um, aviation workers, it's a huge part of the tax base for the state and the, and the city. So that might have been had something to do with it. Well, I want to turn to some sports news. Wichita State University went to the NCAA basketball tournament with a new coach this year. In our first team meeting, I wanted to talk to him about, you know, just trusting the coaching staff. It was my first head coaching job, and I just told him I wanted them to trust me. I was going to give them 110%, and I wanted them to give me 110%. Coach Isaac Brown took over leading the team in November. They were eliminated Thursday night after a loss to Drake University. But, Tom, what did you think of the team's season overall? Uh, uh, well, they were picked to finish seventh in their conference, and that was when they had the, the former coach, Greg Marshall, had to resign. So the, the fact that they made the tournament, won the conference title, uh, was just was just amazing. Um, it, the loss last night was difficult. They should have won that game, to be honest with you. So I think that's going to leave a little bit of a, a bitter taste in, in fans' mouth. But, you know, really, if you look at it in its entirety and take a step back and say, look, where, where they were at in November, which was chaos, and they also had a terrible time with COVID-19 and missed a bunch of games, to where they finished up winning the conference, getting into the NCAA tournament, I think you'd, you'd probably on, on all take that. And what about Coach Isaac Brown? As I said, he took over leading the team in November, so his stay is, is relatively new. Right, and, and I think Wichita State made a good move, made him, took off the interim tag, made him head coach. Um, the players really, really respond to him and like him. He's a longtime assistant coach. He's got, I think, 19 or 20 years in the business, uh, well-respected by his peers in the industry as well, um, uh, a real you know, players-type coach. Um, got a lot out of this team that people didn't think was 
that was there. So I think they're I think they're in a good path with him. Mm. And just really quickly remind us of of what he was inheriting when he took over this role. Uh, uh, well, a uh, lot of lot of players had left in, during the off season, so he had a lot of new players coming in. Um, you know, I think their, their, their first three games were canceled because of COVID. Um, he was bringing in a, you know, a, a newer, he'd been an assistant coach for the program for several years, so he didn't have to change too much. But, you know, being an assistant coach and being a head coach in college basketball are, are really different. Assistant coaches tend to be the, the good cop, as it were. Um, and now he had to be the head coach, which sometimes can be the bad cop because they're, they're, they're deciding who gets to play, who doesn't get to play, things like that, or in charge of discipline and things like that. So he did a, he made a nice transition from that, from the seat just to the left, as they call it, to the head coach's seat. And I think the, the players were very excited, and they responded to him. You could tell by the way they played, they responded to that. Eddie, as we wrap up here, I'd love to hear what you're working on. What's the next thing people should be watching? I was worried you're going to ask me a sports question. <laughs> um, um, really, just focusing on vaccines and the rollout, and like Teresa was saying, the access to these vaccines. So that's going to be really a focus at KMUW for for the next first few months, um, as well as just the mental health implications of the coronavirus. We're we're starting to look at you know returning to normal, adjusting to to whatever comes next, and and there's you know, grief and, and trauma that we all have to process. So really looking at that kind of stuff. Tom, briefly from you. Uh, I think the vaccine stuff, Carl Eccles, uh, who's a reporter on our staff, is working on efforts in the black community to get the vaccine through the black churches. So that continue to be a focus for us. That's Tom Shine, KMUW's Director of News and Public Affairs. Also with us, KMUW reporter Nadia Fo. Thanks to you both. In case you missed it, I joined KMUW's Democracy on Tap this month to talk about journalism and its role in democracy. You can hear the whole conversation at KMUW.org under events. And tune in to a roundup of national and international news with 1A every Friday from 9 to 11 right here on KMUW. Today's producers were KMUW's Sarah Jane Crespo and 1A's Amanda Williams. This program was part of our 1A Across America collaboration funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm Jen White. Thanks for listening.